meeting. Um, we um, came into session at 6.30 and voted to go into closed session. Um, we discussed matters related to collective bargaining with um, the city union AFSCME Local 3399. And we're now resuming with the rest of our agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is uh, council comments and announcements. Are there any comments or announcements? I think Bruce had his Bruce. up first. Yeah, right. Terry, Bruce, okay. and then Joy. Thank you. Um, I saw on the uh, agenda that we are talking about uh, rent stabilization tonight and doing our second vote on that, and that I believe on the rolling agenda I saw. Well, actually, it's not rent stabilization; it's rental licensing. Rental licensing, you, okay. yes. And then I think rental, uh, rent stabilization is coming up in the near future. Yes. Okay, okay. and I'm concerned that. Uh, at this point, we've heard a lot of concerns uh, from the tenants and from landlords, and I feel that a lot of those concerns have not been addressed uh, at this point. Um, and I think that uh, that we need to have uh, some hearings uh, where we get some of the these issues not only laid out on the table in a uh, more orderly fashion than what we've had at the at the uh, few public comments that we've had, but also uh, bring everybody to the table and, and uh, uh, sit down and talk about what the issues are and come up with a, uh, a real plan. And I don't feel like at this point we have uh, developed a, a plan. Um, in, in response to that, um, that is actually what we've got coming up. Um, we have um, Ken Barr, the expert who we hired to do this, is, co is coming um, next week um, to um, present to us his proposal to us, um, which should be a comprehensive plan for dealing with the issues that we raised with him at the time that um, we hired him, that we had the interview and that we hired him. And that once those all of the plan and the issues are on the table, we are having a formal public hearing on his plan the following week. Um, and then the council can proceed from there um, as it wishes. Um, I'm hoping that the plan, the, the proposals he put fo puts forward will be um, the kinds of things that the council wants to do and we could move forward with that expeditiously. But we do have scheduled next week a presentation of his proposal to us, sort of a comprehensive um, slate of proposals, and then following that a public hearing on his proposals. So that's okay, what well, we've I look, coming I up. look forward to, to seeing what he uh, has in mind. Um, at this point, I'm just uh, uh, expressing great skepticism that we're going to be in a position to be able to vote on December 4th, as is uh, presented in the rolling agenda. Well, in putting together the rolling agenda, I was trying to make a guess as to time frames, and uh, we will, it will be up to the council whether you feel we need more discussion on that and we're ready to vote or not. Thank you. Please. Yeah, just two things. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to let people know that I've given some information to the city manager and the public works director uh, so that the city can uh, submit information for inclusion in the uh, eight-hour ozone SIP, which leads, which is the local voluntary air quality initiative. Um, at the uh, COG board meeting last week, there was information provided about what the various jurisdictions are submitting to be part of that, and I wanted to make sure that Tacoma Park, uh, that we that we and everyone else get credit for the initiatives that we are taking. So uh, that will all be submitted before December 31st to be included in the uh, plan. And the other thing I just wanted to note was that uh, I got something in the mail in the last couple of days that I was very happy to receive. Uh, it was a letter from uh, the Housing and Community Development staff that went out to uh, home improvement professionals in Tacoma Park uh, that the city's organizing a green building day in, uh, for February and that uh, that's going to hopefully be an opportunity for everyone to share uh, best practices on uh, green building techniques and uh, showcase local individuals who have expertise and uh, there would be an opportunity for people to uh, get a good, good bit of information and I hope that is as interesting as it can be for everyone concerned and people get good information. And I'm glad to see that staff is doing that. Great. Enjoy. I just wanted to um, 
remind people about the schedule of events for the Tacoma Park Film Festival. It's the fifth annual uh, festival, <coughs> and the director, Agnes Moon, made sure that we got our uh, schedules tonight. She welcomes uh, the council and the public to um, the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday events. And there's plenty of um, schedules up here uh, that um, would be on hand at the city, um, probably at the library, if anyone is interested. Um, and I am looking forward to it. It's our first, first film festival that the city has hosted uh, with a, a director, a dedicated creative director for the film festival. So um, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Hope you all will join us. I got a call from a constituent that the lights are out again on the Carroll Avenue Bridge, and I talked to Daryl about it and um, and spent the day trying to get a hold of a, a living person that was somehow related to Tacoma Park maintenance from the State Highway Administration and, and had no luck at all. So I don't know if the mayor or you have a particular contact that's there. Um, I have to do some of my other work tomorrow, so it would be good. Um, but they're all out, and uh, six weeks ago, uh, Daryl called, and they came out and they replaced the, the timer. Okay. Because she says when they're all out, that means that it's the timer. So um, the fix only lasted for six weeks. And as well, one of the light bulbs is out, and when they came out last time, they fixed the timer, but they didn't replace the one light bulb that was out as well. So if they could do both of those, that would be great. We'd be um, happy to. Thank you for your help. Uh, and I want to second what Terry had to say about uh, the housing issues. I feel like you know we're making some great forward progress, and we've gotten to hear a lot of comments from people. And I guess I'm concerned that we heard a lot of comments from folks about um, problems with their units. And I'm, I guess I, I don't see clear to how the process that we're currently engaged in is going to provide us resolution for those issues because we've been kind of more talking about some of the the nitty-gritty issues about how the regulation functions and some of the some of the economic impacts and some of the, the process <laughs> impacts but I'm not really feeling confident that we're getting to the issue of how that relates to the housing quality issues that people brought forward and it, I also I'm not getting a lot of positive feedback that I feel like our, our landlords are buying into the process either. And, you know, ultimately, of course, I'm more concerned about the people, but it would be nice if we could bring them along for the ride as well. So I guess what I would like to see is I would like to, I guess, have a clearer sense of what our process is as we move forward and where we think it's, it's, it's taking us. I know we have this period to review the rent stabilization issues, um, and then it doesn't come up again for another three years. And I would hate to have this period go by without addressing all of those people who came and talked about, you know, cockroaches and all that. And, you know, I have a, I have a, a person who was a, a renter in an apartment complex right off of Sligo who I had regular contact with, was having mold in her unit, really wanted to stay in her unit. They went through the air conditioning rigmarole, and she was afraid to make comments about the quality of her housing because she didn't want to get evicted, but also it was becoming impossible to live there, and in the end, everybody got evicted. And within the current boundaries of what we're able to do, we weren't able to solve her problem and protect her at the same time. And I just, I, I don't feel, I don't feel confident and I don't see how our current process is going to help us to resolve what, what I think is, you know, the, sort of the big core, core issue that we need to deal with. Um, there, there is an ongoing process with um, the tenant's right to remain in their units, um, and that has to do with what the state law is. And um, I think what we should do is we should continue to work on it. It's an issue we've got to get state law changed so that it recognizes not only county um, housing law, but also city housing law. And that's that's basically the core of the issue. Without that, um, tenants really don't have protection against evictions. So that that is an issue that we have to work on separate for from what we do within our own housing law. 
I would certainly like to see some version of just cause eviction. Um, it was passed in Oakland, California when I lived there, and I thought it was a great boon to um, protecting tenants from arbitrary processes. Um, so that's, I think that's great. I just, I guess I, I want some more information about where we see this discussion going, you know, all of the components that are a part of it. The thing that I see in the rolling agenda is minor adjustments to the city's XYZ law related to housing, and it, um, I feel like there's some restriction on really having a, an all-out, you know, conversation about it. And we talked at one point about bringing um, so a couple of authors from the various studies that have been done. Rick, Rick Nelson from the, the County Hawk was one of the folks who worked with the Maryland University of Maryland Executive Program. I think Jacqueline Rogers, who was one time Housing and Community Development Director under Paris Clendenning's administration. I know she has come and spoken at some things at HUD that we had, it was very knowledgeable. Since they've both kind of been immersed in that Tacoma Park report, um, it, I think it would be interesting to hear from them if they would come and talk to us. And I think we all agreed at one point um, that we would like to have them come and speak to us before we completed this this process of, uh, of answering those questions. And, and, and I guess the other thing is, that, um, and maybe this is just too utopian to, to go over, but that's just Tacoma Park. I know, it's Tacoma Park, so I'll, I'll throw it out there. Um, I just think it would be great if the, if the city could provide some structure for the landlords and the tenants to, to talk about their issues and try to come to, to as close as maybe they could to some, some understanding of each other's positions, to, uh, to work towards a, 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 resolution, a, a resolution that works for both parties. Um, I know that's too much to ask for, but maybe they could get closer. And we talked a little bit about that, but that didn't really, that didn't really go anywhere. And I, I guess I'm, I'm still interested in it, so. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, I think that the major step that the council has made moving forward was to hire an expert who is um, able to sort of help us pull together all the issues around rent stabilization. And, and help us pull together a proposal that deals with all of the aspects of that together rather than dealing with them piece by piece as we had been doing. So I think that's an important thing to do. Um, I am not adverse, and you and I sat down with the staff and had a very wide-ranging discussion about, you know, looking down not just, you know, for the next two, three, four, five years, but looking down for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, as soon as the staff has done some of the background work we asked them to do, I'm planning to bring them um, to a, up to the council for an agenda item and talk about some of those issues also. Um, I would be happy to arrange for the folks who worked on the Maryland report um, to um, come to us and make, some, make a presentation on some of the thoughts they might have. Um, I had hoped that we would be moving forward a little bit faster than we are. Um, Hiring an expert means that we get some additional expertise, but it also means we're somewhat subject to his schedule. Right. And, um, you know, the we were delayed for a couple periods of time getting him to come and talk to us initially, and we're also having to work with his schedule and getting him to come back. So I no well, longer... And I was, I was gone when he came, so because I was in New Orleans, so I missed out on that. Okay. Um, but I, um, I am no longer assuming that the council is necessarily going to finish by year's end. But um, I do think that we are moving in a good direction with some very expert help. I'm always interested in getting additional expertise. Um, and I think that we do have to make um, a place for talking about some of the bigger, longer-term issues, and okay. I'm planning to do that also. And that's, that's what I assume is the follow-up from the sort of brainstorming session with staff that you and I had. Yeah, that was great. Mayor Porter, yeah. given the... Uh, the difficulty in scheduling time uh, with our expert, uh, and given the complexity of the issue, I wonder, if, you know, how soon we're going to be getting the report uh, so that we can have a chance to review it and have our question prepared for him uh, when he does come to this council. Um, I can't tell you that, but certainly maybe maybe we can get that information to staff to just let them know that we would like to get that information as soon as possible. He is scheduled to come next week, and that's all set up. Right. And he's but if we get it on Friday, uh, it doesn't leave a lot of time to 
to really uh, review And even material. if we can get some pr preliminary information from him earlier, that would be helpful. Right. Thank you. I did. Um, as Colleen brought up the issue of street lights, I, I thought I would just add, since you're already contacting PEPCO, that there are some Carroll Avenue neighbors who would really, really like the street lights turned on where the new streetscaping is. Uh, we've um, tried to uh, check on it, and I think we're going to have to go to a higher level um, to get action on it. Uh, it's taken them up to a year to turn on new light fixtures in the past, and um, I, I believe that July was when the city uh, put in the request, and they've followed up several times now, but um, it would it would be nice, especially now as we're, as um, evening is setting in a lot earlier, uh, if we could have those lights turned on immediately. Um, the only other announcement I have is um, uh, something that took place this weekend that the mayor and Daryl uh, Braithwaite joined me for, and that was um, Mrs. Hevia moving and uh, having an open house at her new home at 7133 Carroll Avenue. And um, I am very pleased to report that the, um, the house looks terrific. Uh, there are a few things that she uh, opted to improve, and, and those changes will be made before she moves in next week. Um, but in, in general, the house is lovely. Uh, the, the workmanship and um, the design of the house is just exceptional, very high quality, and I think that's a tribute to the hard work of Daryl uh, in overseeing this project for the county. Um, I really appreciate that, and, uh, and I know it's been a long road, but um, I think the outcome is well worth it. So thank you uh, to Daryl and to the city manager and to the mayor um, for uh, everyone's hard work on this issue over the last five years. And I just wanted to follow up um, with that and, and say that it was a very nice um, gathering. And Mrs. Hevia um, spoke very eloquently about her uh, gratitude at being a member of our community and the help that she'd gotten from um, her neighbors and from the city. And, you know, it's been a very long and difficult process for everybody, probably for the Hevias and Daryl more than for those of us sitting up here. But it, it did feel as if it was it was worth it and, um, you know she's she will be set with a, a, a very comfortable and um, well adapted place for her to live and um, you know the house has been preserved and looks I mean just driving by um, even though the landscaping hasn't gotten done yet the, the house looks so much better it's very it was done very well and I would agree with what Joy said about the quality of the work <coughs> it was very nice I just wanted to uh, mention one other thing. One other thing. Now that uh, Mark has joined us, I just wanted to note that this is our uh, first meeting since the uh, general election last Tuesday, and I wanted to congratulate Mark on his very uh, handy win for county council. I know we're going to be discussing the uh, election process for a successor later in the meeting, but I just wanted to recognize the all of the hard work that you've put in and the great effort and the outreach that you've made and it finally bore results and I'm real happy for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, he's already been elected. <laughs> okay, the, the, uh, the next item in front of us is uh, two sets of minutes. Uh, we have the minutes for October 9th and October 16th. Move adoption of the minutes. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of adopting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are adopted. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment period. This is the time that's on the agenda that's set aside for comments on items that are not on our regular meeting agenda. That would include work session items as well as any other topic that you would like to bring before the council. I'd ask that when you come forward that you identify yourself and you keep your comments brief um, I will use the little timer, um, the monitor on the podium, and I'll let you know, Pat, when your uh, time is up. Yep, my name is Pat Loveless, 7620 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park. One thing I want to do is I want to thank Terry Siemens and his wife, Joyce, for the uh, 
help they gave us at the Franklin and other people around the city getting back and forth to the poll this election. They worked tirelessly bringing people back and forth, shuttling people to the polls so they can vote and back from the polls so that they can get back home again afterwards. They brought people from Franklin Apartment, Victory Towers, and I'm sure other places too. And also I want to uh, tell people that uh, this election day shows what can happen when people realize that their vote is counted, that their vote is important. And also I'd like to ask everybody when their son, their family member, or whatever turns 18, one birthday gift I, I would like to see them give is a voter registration kit so that they can register to vote. Because that, I would like to see the uh, use of drugs and alcohol banished as the right to passage into adulthood and replaced with registering to vote and getting out and doing the actual adult thing to vote. That is the actual adult, uh, actual way of passing from childhood into adulthood. And I'd like to see everybody take part in that. We have shown this time what can happen when people are serious about what they want. We have taken control of the House. We have taken control of the Senate. We have got a new governor. And we have, in Tacoma Park, is well represented in our county council, our delegates, our government, everywhere. We, and our comptroller, don't forget. We are, we are represented everywhere. And that is because people cared enough to vote. And it goes to show, because I'm very happy, you know, that I am a damn old crap. <laughs> and I am proud to be Tacoma Park them all crap. And I think everybody should get up there and vote. It doesn't matter whether you are Republican or whether you are like me. A proud American. Dem all crap from Tacoma Park. Come on out. Thank you everybody for what you've done this election. Thank you. And also I want to thank County Council and the Mayor for signing my uh, card for my nephew Frankie and my niece Colleen and my sister Karen because I'm going up there next week to see them all on Thanksgiving in Massachusetts. So remember, this is a bad time of year to act like a turkey now that Thanksgiving is coming around. <laughs> Carry on the good work, for Tacoma Park is going to rule. Yeah. Th thank you, Pat, and, and you have a good trip. I will. Thank you, thank you very much. Ooh. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, my name is Jim DeLuigi. I reside at 7106 13th Avenue. Um, Good evening, Mayor and Council, and congratulations, Councilman Earl. I remember that at the... Uh, at the I, I get my name back. That's the best part about this election. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, I know. I did that as a, as, as a little ploy when we had the Tacoma Park uh, meeting on uh, the Metro Station. It was quite comical. Um, I'm here tonight just to talk about a minor issue of trash pickup. And... Before I explain the problem, I'd like to thank the city uh, and the uh, trash department for coming today to pick up trash uh, that was not picked up uh, on Friday. Uh, everyone had their trash out, and the trash didn't get picked up. And we tried to figure out why. And um, one of the explanations offered by the city was that the city holiday was observed on Friday and as a result, they pick up trash on Thursday. Well, if you look at the Trash and Recycling website, it says Veterans Day is observed on November the 11th, which is contrary to the explanation. And it seems that the employees who have the day off have a different schedule than is published on the website for <coughs> trash pickup. Again, on the positive side, once the problem was seen, we did get a response to come and to come and pick it up. Uh, another aspect of this problem is when trash, uh, when holidays occur on Monday, trash is picked up on Tuesday. When holidays occur on Tuesday, it's picked up on Wednesday. When it occurs on Wednesday, it's picked up on Thursday. When it occurs on Friday, it's picked up on Thursday. It makes no sense. Uh, when people miss the day and uh, put their trash out on Friday, and Friday was a holiday, it's going to just sit out there for a week unless we're conscientious enough to pick it up and take it back. Every other holiday is picked up the day after. So I just ask that you consider changing the, the, the current process 
so that if holiday does fall on a Friday, you pick up the day after. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have to say, other than, again, thank you very, very much uh, for picking the trash up today. And I would like to give you these two proofs of indication that on your website, it is November the 11th as the Veterans Day holiday on the trash. And on the library website also, on their calendar, it has the 11th as a holiday. So the information given to the general public apparently is different. Any of it, and any information given to the employees. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Jim. And, and I did get uh, another phone call from your neighborhood with the same concern. Um, I, um, I wonder if, um, when we finish the public comment period, uh, Daryl, you could come up and, and clarify what the trash pickup schedule is, because I think that uh, Jim's correct that there isn't an understanding of, of what things are supposed to be. My understanding was that on holiday, that Monday was the sort of the disposable day and people got moved around from there, um, except Thanksgiving where you have two days. Um, but it might be, this might be an opportunity to, to let people know. And, and I would agree, I think we need to be more clear about what the, what the days are. And it might not be a bad idea to go back to doing what we did with little reminder cards when it's going to be something unusual, um, a Friday holiday or, or Thanksgiving. So thank you. thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thanks. Mayor Porter. Yeah. I actually spent much of my lunch hour today on this very topic <laughs> because Long Branch Sligo happens to have Friday trash pickup. And I learned a couple of interesting things. Um, one of them is that this won't happen from a Friday trash pickup again until July 4th of 2008. So you might want to put that on your calendar. Um, I have on my desktop a list of all of the holidays for which what will happen for the next five years. And uh, I could parse it out by which trash pickup day it is and, and email it to Daryl. Um, also, uh, one of our folks in Long Branch Sligo who's on the county alert system was uh, received an email and that's how he knew that the trash pickup was, was going to be off because uh, it's part of the, the uh, alert system. So people could, I, that's what surprised me too because when I first called and and talked to the public works director, she said she didn't, she thought it was only for emergencies, but, right. but Tom Thomas said that he received an announcement that the, the holiday was coming up, and, and that's how I'm, he I'm on the emergency it. alert system, too, and I didn't get one, so I'm surprised at that. Well, we'll have to, we, should, we, should find out, we should find out more about it and see if we could do an email alert for folks, but yeah. I'll, I'll send you that list of holidays. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Daryl, could you just sort of clarify, since we seem to have a, a teachable moment here, or a, a public informationable moment? Yeah, yeah. What, what generally happens with these is uh, that you don't pay attention until it happens to land on your collection day. Um, so unfortunately, uh, with some of the holidays, it's not a consistent day. With the Monday holidays, it's pretty consistent, and those folks that have the Monday recycling route and the yard waste collection understand the routine for Mondays. For holidays like July 4th and Veterans Day that move from day to day, year to year, uh, though the date stays the same, it does create some confusion. Um, just some points of clarification, our collection crews um, have, a, have a route to run every day, so we don't have a day that we can collapse um, and still provide our full range of service. We either have to double up, which is generally what happens, or we have to cancel collection like we do with yard waste on uh, Mondays. Anytime there's a Monday holiday, we cancel the Monday yard waste program, but the Monday recycling gets picked up the following day. Uh, it's been a, uh, the way the um, operation has run as long as I've been here and probably predates me um, is that generally we keep to the five days a week the normal work schedule and we don't usually um, extend collection to the weekends due to people's schedule, the additional cost of overtime, and um, the fact that we have um, rules in place about ho how overtime is used and spent and we don't have mandatory overtime within the city. So we don't want to get ourselves into a situation where half of our employees can't come in and we can't perform the service that we've told people that we are going to perform. So that's one of the reasons Saturday doesn't happen. Of course, having said that, there is one holiday where it has to happen, which is Thanksgiving, since we have two days off that week, Thursday and Friday. We can't collect the bulk of the, that amount of trash and recycling in any one day. So uh, we pick up Thursday's route on Wednesday, and we pick up Friday's route on Saturday. And it's that way every year and has been every year for 
years and years and years. Um, so uh, our program is that the, the trash and recycling generally moves to the following day because obviously it's a little easier. Even if you've forgotten, you put it out, it just has to sit there until the next day. So it's, it's intuitive to, you know, use the day after except when we run into situations with Friday holidays since we don't use the Saturday for a collection day except for Thanksgiving. There's no intuition that gets you there if you've forgotten that the holiday is taking place. We pick it up the day before. That information is on the city's website, very clearly laid out, goes through each day. If Monday is a holiday, here's what happens. If Tuesday is a holiday, and goes on and includes Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, the, uh, the holiday list, of course, says Veterans Day is November 11th because that's just the standard calendar and Veterans Day is November 11th. But I'm sure any of us that have that holiday understand that when a holiday falls on a weekend, you get either Friday if it's a Saturday holiday or Monday if it's a Sunday holiday. That happens at workplaces all around the country. So that's just the general way that holiday, holiday time is given to employees of any company uh, when the holiday falls on the weekend. Of course, that's again something required in our contract agreement with our employees. It's something we have to follow. Um, so it's it's uh, just something that's in place. I that think that the confusion that was caused though was cause, caused by not not all organizations observe Veterans Day as a day off, mm -hmm. and so there were a number of people who were working on Friday and who probably wouldn't have thought that in fact it was going to be a holiday or mm -hmm. that it would be that it would be the day that Veterans Day would be observed on because they work on Veterans Day anyway. Yeah. And I think that's what created some of the confusion. Sure. sure. And it would be the same if we had Columbus Day. I mean, the other added problem for us, you know, internally is that we have three holidays in November. It just makes November a very difficult month um, for any work to get done because you're losing three days right off the bat. And of course that's when we're in the midst of leaf season, leaf collection as well as all the other things we do day to day. So it's a problematic holiday, uh, not only for the residents, which were frustrated by the, the confusion, but also for our own employees. Um, uh, the supervisor of that di division made a decision to, to just go as often as they can throughout this week to pick up the rem rem uh, remnants of the Friday route um, after the, no the staff no picks up their normal routes. And again, we have a collection route every day, so once they've finished, he dispatches a couple of trucks to run through a few of the Friday route streets so that they'll have some collection before Friday. It's generally not something that we do, but I think given the, the level of concern and the number of calls that we've had, it's something he felt um, that he could and, and should do as a way to try to, um, you know, keep people from having to have their trash cans full for another week. Well, th thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. and, and if we end up with a situation where there is a holiday and a Friday, in what did you say, 2008, maybe we should make some special effort to. Now we do plan a year in advance, not Colleen's five year calendar, but maybe we'll take that under advisement. If, if, if I might follow up, um, please look at the website. It yeah. says the city observes the holiday on the 11th. That's where the problem occurs. It's not an, you know, an issue that the city does say it picks up trash if it's on Friday. I think that's a problem in itself. But that's a separate problem. What's happened here is the city says it observes November the 11th as the holiday. That's Saturday. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, I, I did get my mail on Friday and didn't get my mail on Saturday. So we, we were in a, the next time Veterans Day falls on a Friday, we probably should be more clear about what it is we are doing and what day that that will happen. And I appreciate that, Jim. And what year will that It doesn't happen in the next five years. Well, it, we can. Maybe maybe we state. won't have to be around and worry about it, but it's worth it. Speak for yourself. Making it <laughs> let's send <laughs> let's send a postcard because, as Daryl reminded us today, the council actually cut uh, the budget for postcards that formerly were sent around yes. to remind people of these important things, and we yes. could certainly think about reviving that yes. just as a courtesy to the public. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, appreciate um, that reminder, Jim, and appreciate the explanation, Daryl. Um, the next item on the agenda is the city manager's update. Uh, just a couple items about the community center project. Um, I think as Suzanne may have mentioned last week during my absence, um, we recently met with uh, James F. Knott Construction and other parties to try to finalize the settlement agreement with PowerMax, which is the mechanical subcontractor. 
Um, that agreement is still pending. There's still a few issues that we're trying to work out between the parties. Um, I had a follow-up meeting today with um, Bob Hamilton and John McHugh from James F. Knott to continue to talk about the other items on the punch list and um, trying to see what we can do to get that process resolved. Um, as part of that effort, uh, Lauren Sabel and other members of the design team will be conducting a punch list reinspection this week. And we have also asked uh, Lauren Sable um, and their team to basically give us a cost estimate or evaluation of the punch list um, so we can continue to try to work through the financial issues on phase one. Um, Really not much to add about phase two. The, really the only remaining work that TRG Construction is currently performing for the city is the installation of the elevator on the Maple Avenue side of the building. And as I've advised the council before, uh, the actual cab installation should be occurring um, beginning later this month and continuing into December. So we do expect that <coughs> elevator to be functional by year's end. Um, also in regard to the community center project, and the council is aware of this, but for the benefit of those in the community, um, the gym feasibility study uh, has been received from ANC, ANCL Architects. Um, as the council has previously discussed, uh, the review of that report will begin with the community center liaison committee, and ANCL Architects will be making a presentation to the liaison committee on November 21st. Uh, that meeting will be held here in the community center and will basically get underway at 7.30 p.m. Um, are there any other questions about the community center before I move on to any other items? Uh, can you say something about the signage? I've seen some still temporary looking signs around. Um, is, is that I, I it's the card moving. reader system is in place and yeah, maybe it, the signs will be soon? Yeah, it is. Um, basically, we have done most of the design work um, internally, Councilmember Austin Lane. Um, that needs to go over to the company we've retained to actually bid it. Um, Suzanne Ludlow is working on that project, and I do expect her to be done with that uh, in the very near future. Uh, Councilmember Siemens? I kind of related that a question. Uh, one week while you were uh, out of town and Mr. Hobbs was here, I uh, pointed out that uh, frequently, or, or occasionally at least, when uh, people would come in the front entrance mm -hmm. in the front of the building and go to the police dispatcher to look for directions, that uh, they didn't seem to know much about the building. And I wonder if it would be possible to maybe give our uh, officers or our dispatchers a little tour of the building so that they know where things are. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a few other items unrelated to the community center project. Um, I think Suzanne may have touched on this last week in my absence. Um, the closing uh, deadline for submitting applications for the police chief position uh, was November 3rd. I did have a conference call last week with uh, Jim Mercer of the Mercer Group, who is the executive search firm. Um, the council approved retaining to assist me in that process. We received approximately 90 applications for the position, uh, which I was very pleased with. Um, in consultation with Mr. Mercer, I have whittled that number down and have authorized Mr. Mercer to proceed with doing reference and background checks. Um, on a much smaller group of applicants. I'm hoping to receive Mr. Mercer's report back on that list of candidates um, in approximately a week or so. And I anticipate that interviews will either be held the last week of November or early December. Just need to work out some scheduling. Uh, so the process is moving forward. Uh, the last item I had, um, which I think is good news relative, or hopefully will be good news, for the uh, revitalization of the New Hampshire Avenue corridor, which is one of the council priorities. Um, staff has had some discussions um, about possibly having a satellite farmer's market up in the New Hampshire Avenue corridor, um, and has had some discussions with the Tacoma Park farmer's market about that. Working jointly, we have identified at least a grant opportunity. There's not funding that is, has been secured, but at least an opportunity perhaps to obtain some grant funding in that effort. Um, the program is known as the uh, Project for Public Spaces. It's through the Kellogg Foundation. Um, and there, we have, are in the process jointly of applying for a $40,000 grant. Um, there is no financial obligation on the part of the city. Um, this kind of came up with the deadline somewhat suddenly. And uh, our role is basically to function as a principal partner 
um, on behalf of the grant application. They are not a 501c3, so without our participation, they were not in a position to move forward with filing for that grant. Uh, if we are successful, um, it would basically provide some startup capital for setting up a satellite market up in the Crossroads area. Um, they would also be applying for funding for two other um, projects. One would basically be to set up a debit purchasing program through the existing farmers market um, for the WIC food program to allow participants in that program to uh, purchase food from the farmers market and would also provide um, some training and other startup assistance for minority growers. Um, so basically the application has just been submitted. I'm not sure exactly when we will hear something back, but at least there's an opportunity perhaps to get some funding for some very beneficial projects in the area. Sounds good. Yeah, I was wondering if you could provide us with any information on the citizen survey. That has kind of lingered mainly because it was assigned to Suzanne Ludlow, who, as you all know, tends to get pulled off on other projects such as the Tacoma Metro development. I have reassigned that project to Vanita George since a considerable amount of the community center work is now completed. Um, she's trying to tie up a few loose ends on the community center project, and then that is one of her highest priorities is to get that going. Good. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, we're beginning our regular meeting with a second reading of the ordinance authorizing the addition of additional the installation of an additional speed hump on Willow Avenue. Um, I'm assuming that the issues are the same as they were um, last week. Um, the, there's been a clarification in terms of the location and the title, and also clarification that the ordinance would be effective immediately, which presumably means as it's voted on this evening. Anyone like to move the ordinance? I'll move it. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any council discussion on the ordinance? Is there any public discussion on the ordinance? Just want to, my name is Mr. Pat Lovelace, 7620 Maple Avenue. I just want to uh, reiterate the fact that when you put the new speed bump in, two things I'd like to see done. One is uh, put the speed bump in, in, uh, in, in, uh, also pay attention to uh, the health care and uh, the health needs of people who are going to be driving over those or riding over them because some of us have really bad bones and bad backs. Try to make them vertebrate friendly. And the second thing is, is I think putting speed bumps in, in conjunction with law enforcement on these speeders and maybe make, strengthen the laws to make sure that when, if they're caught speeding, the, uh, the fine is very severe and the penalty is very severe. But, you know, I, that's what I think should be done, to, to, uh, to enforce the existing laws, maybe make, make them stronger, and if you've got to put the speed bumps in, make them vertebrae friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other comments on this uh, ordinance at second reading? All right, seeing no one else, uh, this is the second reading of the ordinance. So we'll, did you want to say something? Let me just kind of wrap this up uh, for the council's benefit. It, um, I appreciate that Steve Shapiro has uh, worked very hard on this issue and the community um, was very supportive of the third speed bump being added. Uh, the, the community and the council were a little uh, reluctant to um, deviate from the city standard, but uh, I, I do think that um, it is incumbent on the city uh, to have very good evidence that our city standard is the right one, that it is achieving the goals that people expect it to. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that all the comments have been conveyed to the city manager, but I hope that uh, last week's discussion on this and the additional information that was requested will be um, provided as soon as available. Okay. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Porter? Aye. Councilmember Austin. Aye. Councilmember Barry. Aye. Councilmember Clay. Aye. Councilmember Elrich. Aye. Councilmember Siemens. Aye. Councilmember Williams. Aye. All right. The ordinance passes its second reading. As I noted, it is effective as of right now, 816. So you can <laughs> go out there with those lights and start putting those speed bumps in. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to the neighborhood for bringing this to our attention. And thank you for um, to Daryl for helping us expedite this. Thank you.
Um, the next item on the agenda is the second reading of an ordinance uh, regarding the changes to the city code regarding um, housing rental licenses and commercial occupancy licenses. And this is the same um, um, ordinance that we saw last week, and I very much appreciate the staff putting the new language in red. That helped a great deal in terms of identifying. Thank you. Um, it helped a great deal in identifying the new language. Um, is there any questions or comments on the council's part? I think we've talked about this even prior to the first um, first reading. Someone want to move the ordinance? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any additional council comments? Are there any additional public comments on the ordinance? All right, seeing none. Um, this is the second reading. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Porter. Aye. Councilmember Member Austin Lanes. Aye. Council Member Barry. Aye. Council Member Aye. Council Member Everidge? Aye. Council Member Seaman? Aye. Council Member Aye. Uh, the ordinance passes at second reading. Um, the third item on the agenda tonight is a combination of a discussion and a, if the council decides to move forward, a resolution. Um, Jesse, would you like to go ahead and introduce this item? Councilmember Elridge has, of course, been elected to serve on the Montgomery County Council, and he has submitted his resignation effective December 3rd, 2006. Um, and pursuant to the pursuant to the city charter, because the vacancy on the council were, will occur more than 240 days before the next regular city election, there will need to be a special election to fill the vacancy. The election must be held between 45 and 60 days from the date of the vacancy. Since all the election deadlines will be based on the date of the special election, um, the staff recommends that council move forward with the resolution this evening, setting a date for the Ward 5 special election. Um, the date that the staff recommends is Tuesday, January 30th, 2007. Um, in consulting with the city attorney, uh, the, the charter uh, mandates that the special election be as much as possible like a regular city election so that we don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of the day that the election is held. It should be held on a Tuesday. The polls should be open at the regular um, hours from 8 a.m., from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, That's, um, I think that's it. One, one other thing um, that I'd like to mention is that uh, there is some flexibility, of course, in the polling place for the election. And although the council does not need to decide tonight, uh, one option would be to hold the special election at Columbia Union College in the same polling place that was used in the recent election. That way, the Ward 5 residents wouldn't have to come to the community center to vote. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to put that out as an option. And I could mention there is a city newsletter deadline today. So so we're, we're hoping to get some basic information about the election in the newsletter. Staff also recommends a mailing to Ward 5 registered voters to let them know about the vacancy and the election. Let's see, one other thing I forgot to mention is for the special election, there is no nominating caucus. Candidates who uh, would like to run for the, the vacant council seat uh, would submit a petition with the names of 10 registered voters, qualified registered voters from the ward. And I will be preparing those petitions uh, for those interested. And. Um, there is attached to the council materials and also available over there on the side the timetables that Jesse's worked out, making the assumption that the election was on the 30th and then making the assumption that the election was on January 23rd. Um, and I would I would agree with um, with uh, Jesse's recommendation that it be the 30th. Um, but the the problem with doing it on January 3rd is that the the you have some of the deadlines occurring um, around the time of the of the Christmas and New Year's holidays. 
Um, even just pushing it back a week means that um, you've got, for example, if you do it, if the, if the election is on the 23rd, the, the, date, the deadline for the petition for, to put a candidate's name on the ballot is January 3rd if it's the 23rd and January 10th if it's the 30th. And I think that's a significant, significantly more workable deadline to be on the 10th and on January 3rd. So I would, I would agree with Jesse's recommendation that we should try and do the 30th. Anything else? So Colleen had her hand up. I was just going to move the resolution oh. with okay. the date of the 30th. I'll second it. Okay. It's so, so you're just moving the uh, with resolution. With the date of the 30th. With the 30th on it. But I have a uh, question, too. Okay. Uh, and Jesse, did you say you have spoken with Columbia Union College to see if we could use that as a point? <clears throat> that seems to be uh, perfectly fine. We we could you, we could use that for the election. I, I did speak with someone uh, with Scott Stewart there today, and he didn't see a problem with it. The council will need to adopt an ordinance setting the location for the res. Uh, a location and other matters concerning the election, I'd recommend that you do that uh, in December. But you need to get but, it in the newsletter. But if you're comfortable with the uh, CUC polling place, we can go ahead and advertise that. So it's a, it's available 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, they would they would work with us to um, to make it happen. Just it, it was a polling place in the mm -hmm. recent election. So. The the the. The critical thing about the date is that it sets the date for everything else. And sure. so that has but to I be think it's important to tell them where they're going to be voting. Too. And, and, I, and I think it is a good idea, too. Um, did you have your Well, it was about the place, so I'd, okay. really, I'd like to hear what Mark's thoughts are on that. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I support this, and I support the idea of having the polling up at Columbia Union. Also, I think that would be a, a good thing, maybe even something to think about. Um, in the future in terms of dispersing polling places towards at some point. But certainly for this election, I think it would be good to have it up there. Okay. Anything else? Um, do, uh, do you need something um, in terms of the resolution to talk about the CUC, or can, that, can you just have the understanding that that's where it would be? I, I can go with the understanding, okay. and then we'll include it in the ordinance when, you, when that's before you. Okay. So we couldn't just add it to the resolve clause here. We would have to no. change. Uh, you don't do that by resolution. It's I, I believe it's done by ordinance, the setting the location. Okay. But you have enough you can advertise it. I feel comfortable doing that. So what we have in front of us is a resolution basically setting Tuesday, January 30th as the date of the special election. Right. And that uh, resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any additional council comments? I would just comfort Jesse that this council never changes our minds. So you can go ahead with that location. <laughs> I think that's why we do it by resolution. <laughs> we change our minds. Is there any public comments on the uh, resolution? Just that I, my name is Mr. Pat Loveless. I just want to tell you that I support the uh, 30th because at the beginning of January, a lot of residents are not going to be back in after the Christmas and New Year's holiday, you know, because a lot of people stay out until after the 5th, and some, some of us stay out until after the 8th. So uh, to take that into account, you know, I, I, I support the uh, 30th is the date because that gives people time to settle down after the holidays, get their bills paid, and get their agendas all set up. And I, I, I'm glad to see that that's a date you guys would like to choose because it takes it take, has a lot of consideration for our residents at Tacoma Park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, if there's no additional comments, the uh, resolution is in front of the council. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution passes. All right, the next item on the agenda is a... Um, discussion of um, a proposed development. Um, Mr. Ursiola wants to uh, discuss this with the council. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Mr. Ursiola is here tonight to, um, to present his proposed development, which will be, uh, which is proposed for the corner of Eastern Avenue and Laurel Avenue. Um, I think you've seen this before, however, it's been a while ago, probably about two years ago, and there have been some changes to the plan since then. 
Uh, and so we wanted to bring it um, before you, and this is in preparation uh, for the submittal, uh, more to give you an update prior to the submittal, uh, which will is anticipated um, within two months. Um, uh, the project, if, if you're unfamiliar with the location, uh, it will be located between the existing Pizza Movers building, or the building that's occupied by the Pizza Movers, and the building that's occupied by the post office. There's uh, an area in between there that's currently occupied by a temporary structure that's sort of colloquially known as the shed, and then behind the shed there's a large parking lot um, and uh, that extends back to the next lot. And I'll let uh, Mr. Ursiello go forward. I think in the um, in the packet there's a, a site plan and also uh, drawings of the elevation on Laurel Avenue, which is the top row, and, uh, and then there's an elevation of the entire um, development showing the new building next to the older buildings, as well as um, an elevation from Eastern Avenue, which is the bottom drawing. And, and I would note that all that all that information is available in the in the on paper in the packets at the side there, and it's also up on the city's website. Um, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, the only change, which I think uh, most of you know, or some of them, there are some new council people, but um, is that I decided not to do, I could not do the parking garage, which was going to be on the lot. Um, and basically, that's the only thing that's been taken off the table uh, at this point. The building is exactly the same building that we had approved at uh, the Historic Preservation Commission. The elevations haven't changed. The design hasn't changed. There's nothing different than from what I showed you two years ago in terms of um, in terms of the development. <coughs> uh, this little drawing shows you all the same elevations that uh, um, that we had. And just like Ilana said, the top is the building itself. This one's just a little bit larger. I might just this. Uh, I just had this one. I didn't realize uh, we can pass. Here's a couple. Of them. It just gives you a, a little bit bigger. Uh, we agreed to keep the Pizza Movers building in place, and you can see it very clearly here. The brickwork and, and all the styling um, is uh, is uh, very complementary to the to the um, uh, Pizza Mover building, and it's what Historic Tacoma wanted to see. So nothing has changed on that. The only thing is the parking lot is off as a second phase, hopefully, that I could do down the road. But right now it's just to do the building. Uh, it's been a long process. Um, I, I'm sure some of you are aware of, of how slowly Montgomery County has been moving lately um, since Clarksburg. Clarksburg has kind of put a, a hindrance on all of the projects. And uh, in fact, even the site plan review that we have to go through, um, when, you, when we submit it, we're supposed to get a date, and right now they're um, although not calling it a moratorium, they are calling it um, a temporary delay, and uh, um, we don't know when we'll get in to see um, for the site plan, so um, we just have to wait it out. Um, this project's been two and a half, three years in the making. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's just unbelievable it's taken this long, but uh, uh, I certainly still would like to build a restaurant, two commercial stores, top floor is a restaurant, two stores. The basement, which I had hoped to have, uh, I wanted at one time to be somewhat of a community center. It's not off the drawing board yet, but if the costs keep rising, um, I'm going to have to probably um, rent the, the basement as well and, and uh, instead of do the community service thing that I wanted to do, which was kind of make a, a, a place for just anything to happen um, in the city uh, that we wanted to use it for. So, uh, But that's still a possibility. And, uh, Could you talk about the circulation? Oh, um, this little drawing, uh, this, mine's just kind of colored, but um, you'll, you'll see one of the main things that we talked about many times was having a, a uh, single, uh, a one-way entry into the parking lot that exists instead of having the two-way out, in and out, which, uh, which is really a pedestrian hazard and always has been. Mm -hmm. um, so now the circulation, if you will look, is just one way in, you park and you'll exit out of driveway straight down to Eastern Avenue. So that part of it hasn't changed. Again, that was what we originally proposed with the parking garage. So that part's all going to be put in. It's going to be put in the exact same location so that I have the exact same amount of land allowable for that garage down the road if we do that. Uh, but that should serve, just that alone should, say, should, uh, should make um, the circulation and movement um, a tremendous improvement. 
um, uh, going in and out of the parking or out of the parking lot, and uh, actually frees up some extra spaces because the circulation is a little bit better. So we actually get a few more parking spaces out of it as well. Could could you sort of ex um, show where the current, how far the current parking lot extends? Uh, well, all I mean. Basically, all of this is the existing parking lot. Nothing's really changed. Okay, so except it's just the, the space has changed because of the because there, we put the retaining wall in, and we actually uh, can add a few more spaces in the middle because it's a little bit longer. You don't have to make that big turn to swing around the parking lot. You can actually exit out, and trucks can do the same. So we, a lot of that space that we leave in my parking lot is for some of the larger trucks, the post office trucks, to come in. They actually, have to make a whole big U-turn and then exit out the same way. If they can go down a ramp. It, it frees up, so we add maybe about seven or eight spaces when we add it all together into the existing lot, just because of the configuration, uh, and then having to go down where it says driveway down, which is that long drive down. So it's um, so it's basically the existing lot reconfigured to add some more spaces, but it doesn't right. change the dimensions of the current right. parking. And these little little when I have these little green spots or whatever, these are basically just green areas that have to be curbing and some things that have to be put in now. Uh, with parking lots. My lot has nothing in it now, basically, except for around the perimeter. Um, but they require some curbing uh, in things, and that's what those are. That's, I just have them outlined in green, but it's basically on your map as well. Um, and this is the building here in orange, as, as you can see here. And then it goes, it has a frontage on uh, Laurel, and it also has a, a small frontage on uh, Eastern Avenue. I guess my question is, where, where is the parking to support the building? I mean, how many square feet of building? What's the parking requirement for the restaurant and the retail? Because I, I know it's seven spaces. Even if you are gaining seven spaces, well, they can I, come close to meeting the requirement. Well, well we, we basically, if you, in the parking lot analysis that was done by the architects, and uh, it's what goes in front of the for site plan review as well, um, under the... the um, overlay zone that's allowed in, in the city of Tacoma Park that we approved under the master plan, you're allowed a 50% reduction in the parking. And so if you take the, the added spaces that we do, we have a total of 82 spaces. And those 82, if you, you are also allowed to break them out on peak time. So you have parking requirements at 9 a.m. in the morning, at noon, at 3 in the afternoon, and 7 at night. And then you have a weekend uh, relay. You're allowed to, to adjust for all of those things. Um, so that we can come out so that actually 82 will hit our maximum period so I can cover based on just getting the additional space and the circulation. I mean, that's fine. I mean, I mean that's basically it. I, mean, I, I won't be here when it gets that far, but I've, I've got to say, but we, we went through how long a discussion about the need for a parking garage in Old Town and the lack of adequate parking in Old Town and the idea of giving a 50% reduction to required parking in a place that doesn't have enough parking just strikes me. A bit odd. I mean, well, I mean it's because I remember the argument was that we were deficit in parking here to start, start with. Yeah, I mean, if I could clarify for a moment. Okay. Um, this is actually one of the few properties in Old Town that has adequate parking. Most of the properties do not have adequate parking, um, but this development does have adequate parking, and, and um, because of the uses that are proposed, when you do when you analyze each of the uses based on their peak usage throughout the week and throughout different times of the day, what John is saying is that he can show that he has adequate parking to meet, not beyond adequate, but he has adequate parking for peak usage on his lot for the uses that are on his property. Now, I know a lot of other people in Old Town do use that lot. Um, and um, so, th and that's, I, I'm not going to. We're not reviewing the project right now, but I did want to put that out there. Do you have a traffic? Do you have a parking analysis that was done last time? We have parking analysis that were done last time. We have a parking analysis that was done for 7001 um, Carroll Avenue, um, and there's been a lot of discussion about what's what is needed in Old Town, and not many people agree. <laughs> Um, and we're still looking into it, and but at the time of review, we will come up with a recommendation that's based on um, mm -hmm. the parking analysis as well as, as the needs of the development. Um, can can you say a little bit about 
how the green space uh, will be retained and whether or not that's a parcel that could be sold to the city for parking? Oh, th this, this, you mean mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the lot? For the lot, yeah. you know, um, I just actually put this, it took me 16 months to get this, that lot actually put into one so that now my, 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 uh, <laughs> My shopping area has, instead of being five lots, separated lots are actually one consolidated lot, and I had to do that because of that. The because some of these buildings go over property lines, and they don't allow you to do that anymore. So, so, but it took 16 months to get it through to get that approved, and I had to hire an attorney to actually push it through. But it was just filed literally a week and a half ago, so we're now lot 53 instead of five different lots. Um, so. Now it would actually make it a little bit harder to actually sell that to the city, but because it's all one part, it'd have to subdivide it again. It could be done, but but um, the whole idea is still to come back. I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need more parking in Old Town. It's just my project doesn't need it when you show it on paper for what it is. But you, we all know that Mark's Kitchen parks there. We all know that that, that the Old Talianos there. We know all the other people that are using it. So. I'm not going to sit here and say that we don't need more parking in Old Town. We certainly do. And this garage is definitely needed. It was really a financial concern based upon higher costs and the delays that it got to where we just couldn't. We can't, I can't afford to, or I can't justify putting a parking garage in for, and, and not being able to charge for it. That was the reason for what we talked about one time, having the city come in and metering it so that everybody paid a fair share. And that still can be down on the table. I mean, I, this, this lot is still there. I want you to know that it's being preserved for what we talked about doing with it. And I'd like to see that done. It's just I have to do it in stages from my end of it. I can't. Uh, rents are, you know, Silver Spring has taken its toll on rents and, uh, and on desirability. I mean, everybody wants to go to Silver Spring right now because that's the new in place to go. Um, so... Um, uh, I think the street improvement that we just did on Laurel Avenue has helped get people to take a look at the coma again, and then we're, we're going to do more and more street improvements on Carroll. All of those things, I think, are going to make a tremendous difference on trying to get some of these retailers back. Taliano's has been up now. Um, they're trying to re-rent that as a restaurant, and they're having great difficulty, but they are having a lot of difficulty because it doesn't have any parking. But, but, but uh, it's, no one's breaking their door down to get in to do it. Um, Can I just... Um jump in and say that I'm, I'm very supportive of you moving forward on this, John. I think this uh, design has been rigorously tested yes. by the community. We yes. are very pleased at um, the conclusion you came to and, and got approval for. Uh, and I um, appreciate you, you coming back to us because we have all been very concerned, interested, uh, eager to see um, progress made. And, and I think that uh, some of the streetscaping that you mentioned, as well as that um, on Carroll Avenue that has yet to take place, uh, will um, continue to enhance our yes, community. I, I believe that Silver Spring is not so much of a threat as an opportunity, that it's bringing a lot of interest to this area. And to come apart in our Old Town area, we can define ourselves for that niche that um, many people look for. They look for the alternative area to go to, the boutiques. Um, we have some terrific stores that uh, people are very loyal to. Um, so it, it makes sense to continue to invest in this community. Uh, there um, are certainly challenges, but there are many benefits. And um, I'm glad to hear you say that the green space is there uh, for potential future development of a parking structure. Right. And, uh, and I am I am considering I've never done one before just to throw it out on the table. Um, I am considering taking the uh, since the roof on the pizza movers needs to be redone anyway is putting on a green roof. I've never done a green roof. I have no idea. I went to go look at one. Um, it looks like it'll work. I, I don't know if Bruce has any. <laughs> have you ever seen one in place or whatever? But uh, you actually have to water it uh, for a couple of years. But it's a, it's a small enough roof for me to try, and I'd like to try it, and I'm going to see whether or not, um, uh, you know, what we can do with it. So I, I'm looking forward, actually. I'm actually looking forward to getting to doing that. I can do that on the pizza movers right away. I don't need a, uh, I don't need a permit to, to get that to, to, to replace the roof. So I'm going to start that maybe uh, hopefully in three or four months and just put a green roof on. Just 
because I'd like to find out and, it, and if, how it works. So that's something so that uh, that's even, that would in be the restaurant, here. once people are in the restaurant on the second floor, they would be looking yeah, at Yeah, actually you could. You could see the green on the roof. That's, and, yeah, from the, certainly from the, uh, the, the, the windows that will be on, um, on um, Eastern Avenue in uh, what is like a, um, a banquet room. Or whatever, they'll be able to look right across the thing, and, and uh, uh, you can do these low-growing plants. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, but you know, it does take maintenance. But it, it's I'm going to try it. I mean, it's a Thank small you. enough roof that I think I can right. have some fun with it. And uh, I certainly like anybody else that wants to see it to come up. It'll be kind of fun to see what happens with it. But I, I do want to. I do agree with you on Silver Spring. It's just I do think. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait out a few, a few years here of everybody trying to get into Silver Spring and then realizing, I mean, I, I know people that are looking for spaces in Silver Spring and they're actually looking uh, all the way down near the district line towards Montgomery College where they've built down there, which isn't really downtown Silver Spring. You're starting to get off the beaten path. So I think little by little as Silver Spring saturates, people will come back to Tacoma. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think that, we, you know, that I could rent it. Uh, but I do think we got a couple of years here that it's going to be a little bit slow as Silver Spring takes its toll. But I, I do agree with you that Silver Spring is actually an asset. It's just we have to go through a whole cycle to get back to, to where we were before. For a long time, we were one of the nicest places to be, and Silver Spring wasn't. You know, now we have an alternative. So uh, at least people look at it that way. So, but I do agree with you that way. I pretty much agree with what Joyce said, but I wanted to get clarification on two things. Okay. Um, one is the stormwater issue, and the other one is the just a little bit more about the um, what you've preserved so that you can do the parking in the future. I just want to make sure that the uh, like with the uh, with the ramp that all of those details are left so that you don't have to like undo a bunch of stuff in order to do the parking garage later. Uh, no, we don't. That part we don't. The, the ramp should come in exactly right, and the building can be built to fit the ramp. So it's, it should be. That's all being designed, at least supposed to be. <laughs> I'm not the architect. And, um, and, you're, not, and you're not going to have to kind of go in and shore up what you've no, got, no, so no, that you no, have no, to we're, we're putting we're, stuff underneath for the right. For we're the, doing the retaining walls that should be adequate for the okay. kind of, for the okay. structure. Yes. Um, as far as the stormwater, I do have another meeting with uh, with uh, Ali t tomorrow um, with uh, with our engineer. But we are, we are proposing. I mean, one of the things is obviously a little green roof will actually help in some of the stormwater. It's just less less runoff. Um, but we may have to redo. Um, if you recall the problems when the city took over the system and they put the the, the, the drain down Westmoreland, and then they went up the parking lot, which is where. Um, um, Taliana is the back, back part of, of where, that building. Where the, where the dumpster sat over it? Where the dumpster sat over it, okay. Now, there's a there's a 15-inch main down there, and then there's a 6-inch pipe coming from my lot underground, not really underground, it's almost actually out of the ground, going into that into that drain. My our engineer tells me we're probably going to have to, to change our catch basin on the top lot and increase the size of that to go into the 15-inch, and we should be able to actually take water off even even more quickly. But basically we're not, again, the impervious surfaces really aren't changing from what they are now. So we're not adding any water. This is the same the parking lot where the proposed building is. It's a concrete lot. So in a sense it's just the same. As, so there's no increase in water, but we hope to take it off and it, off it better. And there is, a, uh, at the catch basin, there's going to be a filter system of some system that actually filters the water a little bit and then before it goes in. But, um, but we're, there's no additional runoff to, to, uh, to, the, to, my, to any of the, my project at all. There's no additional so, rate. So the it. sense is that with this phase that there will be no additional impervious surface, but that there will be improvements to dealing with the runoff from the right, impervious right. surface. It will be filtered. A portion of it will be filtered where it goes into this main catch basin. And that catch basin will be designed to take not to take more water and then take it down and put it into a right now it's a six inch PVC pipe that they actually put in. It's not really the best. He's suggesting we probably have to put in a, a nine inch concrete or something like that, or maybe even a twelve that goes into this big box that's under the parking lot right. where the dumpster sat uh, uh, over there, and that should improve uh, 
my runoff gone off, gone off quicker and, and, and into the system. But there isn't any increase in water. I want people to know that because basically that, that lot where the building is is a concrete right. lot now. So I, I know just put it up three stories just like the roof. I know the concern of the neighborhood is that they want not only no more, they want less. I know they want less, yeah. Well, I, in, in a sense, um, uh, you know, the green roof, if the green roof works, it doesn't mean I can't add more green roof to my project. I have no problem with it. I found out that, that as long as there's a heat and air conditioning savings alone, that's tremendous if it works. What I don't know is how, how difficult is it to keep and maintain a green roof. I, I really don't know that. And so I'm hoping this little test will give me some insight about that. But there are different systems out there um, uh, for, for holding water longer and not letting it disperse as quickly and letting it go down the system a lot slower and things. And, and uh, some of it, of course, if it's green, the plants absorb. But, mm -hmm. but um, that's down, you know, I, I don't know enough. I don't really, I think developers are all starting to get into that where we, we know it's there. We're seeing, we know the benefits of it in terms of insulation values and with high utility costs. If you, you're saving 40 or 50 percent of the cost uh, of utilities in your buildings, that's a tremendous savings and certainly worth a green roof. But I, but again, I just don't know how it, how it operates and how it, how efficient it is. You, you should go to the one at the at the, at the co housing Eastern Co Housing Village on Eastern Avenue at the district line. There's a, a building that was converted, an old commercial building converted to apartments, and they were green roof on top. Okay. Well, actually, if I can go in and see it, I'd like to go see it. Uh, my, my fear is that if you remember the old gravel roofs, you know, you had built up gravel. When, when you had a leak, the problem was that you didn't know where it was because it was underneath. You don't know what was streaming. And I'm worried a green roof might be the same because it's a buildup of layers of, of gravel and then dirt and then, uh, uh, you know, a surface uh, on a membrane. So, um, but everyone says things are better now. So I, I'm going to, it's worth a shot to try. So. Yeah. I wanted, can, can I just follow up yeah. just right. from, from Bruce's, Bruce's point a little bit because, the, you know, I've heard some of the same things from the neighbors that I'm sure he has heard from the neighbors about the runoff. Um, and I think it's just worth clarifying a little bit. Um, my understanding is that there's still there is still some runoff that comes off from that that ends up going down the hill, and if I'm understanding what you're saying, the project wouldn't increase the runoff, but if you expand the your your um, drain going into the catch basin, right. it should drain off your parking lot more quickly. That's correct. And so when there's a hard rain, instead of it basically flowing over right. the edge of the parking lot as readily, right. um, that it will go much quicker into the catch basin and that there will, it sounds like there are, it's less likely to be an overflow down the hill situation right. in a hard rain. Right. And, and, and my lot always was paved in a to topographic way that it actually funneled to certain places, whereas the, the parking lot that's behind me, which would be Taliano's or, or the 7001 Carroll lot, actually is, is, is actually crested. It's the old lot that was there when, when I guess Tacoma Ford put it in. So, so there's a lot more runoff, even with that catch basin that they have there, just the way it's designed. Mine, if you know, remember my lot's kind of a little yeah. bit rolling when you come in because it took the contours of the natural water to take it to the same, to the catch basin where it was always. So there is a little bit of a difference in terms of spillage, but yes, the answer to it is, is you're, you're exactly right that it will take off more water quickly and therefore less spillage over on a very hard rain. Okay. It should help for that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add that um, Bruce and I were part of the um, Victory Tower discussion about runoff. It was causing an erosion problem on the park side uh, back behind their parking lot. So I believe that they were required when they got their building permits to put in some, uh, some system that uh, cost a little bit, um, not an exorbitant amount, but it did, you know, involve some additional cost so that the point at which all the water drained uh, had this uh, facility to um, process uh, large volumes more easily. Um, so this is the back of the parking lot of Victory Tower where it meets the, the um, 
Tacoma Urban Park. And um, I'd be happy to put you in touch with the, uh, the owner of that building, um, Jim Brown. He was uh, very careful and um, also very business-minded as they resolved that problem. Well, and I've also been, you know, I took this uh, again, it wasn't too long ago that I gave, I've gone a couple times to WACO meetings and, and given them updates on, on some of the things that we're doing and everything. So, I mean, uh, we can't solve the problem, I mean, wish we could, but right now, but with one project, but little by little, if we all do a little bit, it could make a, it could make a big difference down the road. Thank you. I was just curious, since the district line starts at our curb, I wondered if you'd had any communications with them about uh, your idea to put the driveway out on uh, Eastern Avenue. Well, it, it, the way this lines up, I actually have the curb cut that's already there, so I don't have to go to the district to get the curb cut. I'm going to use the existing curb cut right behind. If you know the back way into the post office there, that, that, that driveway width is wide enough and the curb cut is there. So so they really can't stop me from, from doing that. Uh, but I have, we have talked with them. We've actually sent a couple of messages. We wanted to talk to them about doing some other things as far as traffic. Uh, the one they actually solved already, if you know, you don't, you can't park now on that side of, of Eastern Avenue, and you could before. And that was one of the things we wanted them to do, because if cars are coming out, you don't want to have cars parked right up uh, close right. To, to the driveway. So now you've got the whole lane, so you can actually make a right turn very easily. That what we wanted to ask them was, do they want to make it right turn only, or do, will they let you make a left there as well? That's the only concern that I think that they might come and say, it's too much traffic making a left into into Eastern that you have to go right. And that's a possibility, um, which isn't the most convenient, but it's not the worst scenario in the world either. But but by them, re when they redid Eastern Avenue and making that a no parking side, actually was one of the things we were hoping to ask them for. So they actually did it. it uh, they're not real cooperative as far as responding to to uh, maybe, maybe with the new administration they will be. I don't know. Maybe. We hope. And, and if I can just uh, point out that uh, I think Terry's statement that uh, the line is at the curb is actually incorrect. The line is more like at your building line. At the building line, right. And the sidewalk belongs to the district. Yeah, so the, it's a district sidewalk, and as you go down Eastern, I think the district line can be as much as 30, 40, or 50 feet into people's front yards. Right. Right. And uh, just, just for uh, water again, any water going down, any water theoretically going down the driveway, this new driveway, uh, obviously will go into the district sewer system, not into the coma. So that is, that's actually some additional, less less water. I don't know how much that is of rolling down the... the, the it may be less water for us, but it doesn't help the bay. Yeah. No, it doesn't help the bay, but <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah. And we may be slightly better about yeah. cleaning our so, inlets than they are, from what I've heard. Yeah. And, and, we, and we also yeah. tend to clean their inlets as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't make that publicly known to the district. We're not trying to discourage them from doing it. Anyway, this was just to bring you, fill you in a little bit as to what's going on so that you have a better idea. We have a lot, still a long way to go. Yeah, that was going to be the last question I was going to ask, which is what's the, what's the time frame for the, for the next steps on this? Well, if, if we, uh, after my meeting with Ali, I hope to get that part squared away so we can get the site plan in. They're waiting for the site plan. It's actually partially they're in already. They say they won't give us a date. It used to be four to six weeks. Now it looks like it's two to three, maybe four months before we'll get in for the site plan review. At the same time, the city has to, at least the city will be able to look at the site plan. Once it's submitted, the city can actually do its part. So we can do some of the meetings and the things that we need to do. Um, while that process is going on, we're still waiting for them. But the, and, um, and I think that will, um, at least we can get that part done. So, uh, I mean, you're looking at easily six months again before anything happens. And, and our site plan review goes on at the same time, so we wouldn't be right. entering our formal process until the, your site plan was formally submitted. Is that right? Correct. Submitted, yeah. Right. Once it's submitted, the city gets its copy and the right. city can move on it, which is at least one benefit on this end. Yeah. <laughs> that the city can, we can work within the city and all the, the neighborhoods and things that we need to go to. We can do all of this while we're just waiting for a date from park and planning. Yeah, right. So. Do you have any sense of, um, I mean, have you done any planning that far ahead, Alana? Um, we don't know what any of the dates will be, but once we have, once we're sure that the plan has been accepted as it is, then we'll start looking at it. We'll make sure that 
of the neighborhood organization's heads that need copies, have the copies, and, um, and make sure that they're aware of what the review process is. And then we'll come to council. Um, there will be a public hearing and a work session to review the plan and take comments on the plan. And this will be in preparation for um, the county development review committee meeting. Um, and so at the um, development review committee meeting, which is held at Park and Planning, all the different agencies, including the city, will give comments to Mr. Arciolo as well as his um, architect and engineer. Um, and then there's a period for any revisions. Um, and then once the plan has been revised and resubmitted to um, to Park and Planning, and or it's not really a formal submission, but once it's given back to Park and Planning with revisions, and there is a planning board date, then we would, or an anticipated planning board date, then we would bring the plan back to the council um, for probably um, for a special session and then a resolution. And the resolution would then go to the planning board. And this would be in anticipation of being included in the planning board staff report to the planning board. And I, and I think, I know Bruce let um, his residents know that this was coming up as a council discussion today. And I think it's important to um, reiterate for everybody's um, information that um, this will be coming to the council for formal consideration for public hearings for um, a lot of discussion prior to the council taking any action on it. This today was more of an update and a notification to the council prior to making the formal submission. But um, there will be a, a lot of opportunity for um, public discussion and input and uh, public hearings um, before the council um, takes uh, any formal action. So. So I want to make sure people understand that. And thank you. We appreciate the information. And, um, you know, we will look for it coming back um, for its sort of more I formal too. consideration. I too. I'd like to see this one off the ground. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. And I, and I appreciate your considering the green roof and be yeah. very interested in uh, how that works. Yeah, I am too. So I want to see it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does yeah. the, does, does yeah. it, the council is going to take a very short recess and come back for the final item on our agenda.
with the final final item on our agenda, we might be able to leave a little yeah, earlier than usual. If we could get the uh, rest of the council members up here, I'd like to go on with the uh, final, but certainly not least important item on our agenda. I need two more council members and the city manager. <coughs> you can see how, how important being mayor is. No one ever listens to me. <laughs> Okay, do you all want to come up here? We're, we're very pleased to be considering uh, this evening a um, discussion of an opportunity for the city, um, the opportunity to be certified as a wildlife habitat community. And I assume, Bruce, you're going to explain to the folks at home what that, what that means and why it's important and what we would need to do. Hey, I, I'm Bruce Sidwell. I live at 7209 Spruce Avenue in Tacoma Park. I am the president of something called the Friends of Sligo Creek. And I'm uh, here tonight with, uh, actually with a couple other folks who have been supporting us along the way here. Uh, Susan Harris, was she started out with the Tacoma Port Club being a representative, and actually now she's kind of representing, I think, the Tacoma Boys. Oh, and, uh, uh, but still the Horde Club, I hope. No. Oh. No, actually, Lori uh, Redloff. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Lori Redloff is uh, here from the Tacoma Horde Club. And uh, Tim Mayle, I think, is going to be, should be here shortly, from the Committee of the Environment. And so all well, I know we're, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, okay. so. And we have Mike Walsh with us. Okay. Yes, yeah, and, that's right. and the city, Mike Walsh, right. the city gardener. Well, I, I think you all may have a, a piece of paper there that mm -hmm. I distributed that try to, as succinctly as possible, it really to highlight to what this is about. It's not really rocket science, but there's kind of a lot of interesting little nuances and details that we can get into. But the basic thing is that um, several years ago, actually, I'm not quite sure how long ago that is, not, not been too long ago, the National Wildlife Federation, uh, in order to encourage whole communities to improve their values of wildlife uh, decided that having residents certify their yards and public spaces in wildlife habitat would be a good notion. And then you can get the whole community then also involved and have it certified. Uh, I think the, the benefit that we see, and I think National Wildlife sees, is that you get more of a focus on the non-voting residents of the town, especially now that the that election is over. Uh, the non-voting being the raccoons and rabbits and, and especially the, the birds and the butterflies who are with us but do not have a vote. Uh, get more focus on what they need in their community and then also provide an opportunity for educating your kids in, in a little bit more detail of uh, what's in their backyards and, and how things work backyards for wildlife. Uh, about I guess a little more than six months ago now, a group of us got together, all kind of with the same idea and all sort of at the same time, uh, to just start meeting on this possibility. We have a, uh, and Linda Keenan is a representative from the National Wildlife Federation and she actually was a, a catalyst to, to form in the first several meetings. The, uh, as I said, the, or I think I introduced the folks already, the, the major organizations that have been behind it are Friends of Spiker Creek, the Committee of the Environment, and the Tacoma Park Port Horticultural Club. But we actually have a number of other uh, citizens who are at the meeting with us. Um, it's probably useful to start out with a, a kind of a, a rough definition of what National Wildlife Federation is meaning by habitat. It's a, it's a site that will provide food, and it could be natural food. It doesn't have to be seeds you know, that are, say, bought at the store. It can be just the fact that you've got uh, nectar-producing plants, uh, seeds from, from uh, small plants and large plants, and uh, 
uh, of course, at this time of year, lots and lots of berries that you see, that sort of thing. Let's see, uh, water, that's, for some people that's a little bit more difficult, but it's, it can be as simple as just having uh, water baths, you know, bird water baths. Uh, cover meaning that you've got plenty of shrubs and places for the birds and other wildlife to hide and places for them to raise their young. You tend, you tend to think of uh, birds in this instance, uh, you know, for birds' nests and so forth. But then, uh, here's Tim. Um, We're running a little ahead of schedule. Yeah. Do you right. want to join us up here? Sure. Join your it, colleagues. It could also be uh, for, for salamanders. I've got salamanders in my yard. I even have little tiny, uh, what's called northern brown snakes that burrow way down deep into the, the leaf mulch. Let's see. Uh, so that was you know, cover places to raise young, and uh, then what they call sustainable gardening practices, which uh, if you've been reading gardening columns and papers for years and years, it basically means that you're going to use probably less pesticides and less fertilizer, use a little bit more organic materials, uh, try and narrow down that lawn. I, you've got to keep your lawn for your grandkids, in my case, or the other. It just always happens. And also to get from one of the yard to the other. But to kind of narrow things down so that you've got more room for a variety of other plants. Let's see. Uh, the requirements for a community the size of Tacoma Park would be that we would have at least 100 yard backyards certified. Uh, that we would have four common areas or workplaces, and that's kind of where the city pretty much can, can come in on that. But also park planning and Slide Creek in that area. And, and also three schools need to be certified. And at last count, we already have 38 backyards that are certified, so we're you know, well along the way of what we need to be. Let's see. The, what we would... And I, I put a, a, this is a very simple basic list of what the city might do to help us out. And one is to uh, help select city properties for designation. We've already had some, some nice brainstorming sessions with, with Mike Walsh, the, the gardener, uh, city gardener. And it's, it's actually, it was a lot of fun to try to figure out, you know, which ones might work easily and which ones would take more effort. And, you know, put your brains together and try to figure out how to do that. Um, to, as needed, uh, to work with the volunteers for some needed improvements to those properties. That would be, in the case where maybe the water supply is not what you wanted, if there's water there, maybe we can enhance that. Uh, in some, some parks, maybe you need some help in yanking out some non-native vines that have taken you know, precedence. And so with the volunteers, you can kind of yank those out. Uh, but then coming back in and helping mulch, you know, where weeds were taken out, we kind of keep them under control. So there's a variety of probably fairly low-level maintenance kinds of things, but it's more a matter of time. Uh, three, provide space for outreach, and the examples I give there are if we could have maybe a bulletin board out here someplace in the, in the facilities, uh, and maybe a table or a bookcase so that the brochures and other kinds of things that people would like to share could be made available. Let's see. Provide space for presentations on making yards wildlife friendly. We have a number of people who are well qualified and experienced actually in providing information to the public about how to make their yard more friendly to, to wildlife. And they've got PowerPoint slides and all kinds of uh, goodies for that. So at some point, we'd like to grab hold of one of the, the rooms and, and do that. Let's see. And then uh, I think a, a nice timing uh, outreach event uh, would be the incorporating this whole project into the, the Arbor Day celebration so that we would have tables there and we might even do more at that time. Um, and then it certainly would be a nice thing to have a, a resolution. I've got some models of resolutions that would be glad to pass on that other cities have done. Let's see. Uh, I just want to note that I, I have uh, we have good relations already with the park planning folks, and they're 
they think that this is a good idea. You know, Carol Bergman, she's a very dirty ecologist, and, and Rob Gibbs, and, and some others are saying this is great. They would be glad to say there's certain sections, let's say, of Sligo that we might want to mm -hmm. think about, like uh, the Becca Lily playground area of Long Branch is a really nice spot, and that's actually there. And then others are actually their property, too, of course. Uh, Spring Park. Is Spring Park City or is it uh, City? It's City. Yeah. It's city. Uh, but maybe if we wanted to spread out different parts of the neighborhood, Blagged and Run is the little creek that caused all the problems for the the, re the construction, the uh, renovation. And then because it was underground, but it actually appears above ground, maybe a hundred yards before it hits Sligo. And it's, there's actually a nice little piece of woods right there. And, you know, we can work on that as being potential so it's a sub-site you know, for certification. Let's see. Uh, and then just to give you a, a flavor of, of the kind of things that we would do to make progress on this, we're already, here's the November, December, and, and we're already beginning to work with the city government on possible roles, things that, that we could all do and feel comfortable with. Uh, we've had some conversations with uh, school teachers, uh, we need to draft the, the registration form that I think Daryl has a copy of it if you want to look at it. It's not it's not really intended to come directly from the city. It's really designed to come, say, from an organization that can be sponsored by the city and the city press a resolution and all that. So it's not really kind of a city project per se. And let's see. Uh, We've had already several articles in the newspaper having a problem getting some more stuff in like that. We're going to probably be setting up tables at the farmer's market so that people will get outreach and, and then have some forums available, that sort of thing. And uh, develop more partnerships. We've already had very fruitful conversations with the Audubon Naturalist Society. You know, their chief senior naturalist, uh, Stephanie Mason, looks right. And various businesses, churches, and so on. And, and it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's pretty easy to kind of read this, but I think uh, I just carry it through March, April. Basically, we'll have a, a great Arbor Day, and by then we will have had uh, more outreach. Uh, maybe the program that I was talking about would be March, might be a good time for it. And let's see. Maybe we're going to have a float in the parade item. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's see. Uh, do you want to hear from the other organizations first sure. or have uh, Sure. I okay. wonder if anyone who would, would like yeah. to say anything. Who would like to I'm happy to. Did, I, uh, we, the committee, I think, wrote, wrote a letter and that made the yes. files. I got to pay to do that. But I won't read through that. But uh, suffice to say, the committee fully supports this effort. Um, uh, you know, we're engaged, we've been working with groups and others on, on figuring out what role we can play. Um, and I think, and I may, may have missed some of this, uh, it was sort of sad, but it's the sort of effort that's going to be driven by volunteers, it's going to be driven by these people, it's going to be driven by others. And I think the, the role for the city is, is pretty small, as those public spaces, schools, um, and, uh, and I really think that the broader benefit of this is going to be for education for kids, for uh, public education in terms of the effects of what we're doing in our backyards and our open spaces on Sligo Creek, on the Anacostia River watershed on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, it's, a, it's a good step in the direction of thinking about the way we're connected to our environment. It's a very easy way to do that. And frankly, from the, from the perspective of a, an individual homeowner, the you know, goal when you're to get 100 houses, I think that probably we'll get there and go well beyond that if and as this effort progresses. And, the things that people need to do are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, most people already provide trees for birds or insects to live in, flowers for butterflies to eat. Well, water is really, really the toughest thing. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's pretty easy to get through that certification process for people. And once they're through, then it becomes easier for them to learn more about it. Um, the National Wildlife Federation will start sending magazines about, about backyard wildlife habitat. Um, but we connect it to a network of people uh, in town who are certified. Uh, and find out more information about the sorts of wildlife people are seeing, whether it's salamanders or snakes or frogs, that uh, I think is very exciting. So I think we're, we're fully supportive of the effort and really excited about it. I think it's a really, it's a very doable project. Okay. 
That's great. I, I'm, I'm just here to uh, <laughs> officially uh, announce that the uh, Tacoma Heart Club is, is behind this effort and, and, and is supportive of it. And they officially voted to, to support it. And I'm Susan Harris. I'm actually representing the boys here. Um, I think when I first started writing the gardening coach column for them almost a year ago, the first uh, article they suggested I write was about gardening to attract wildlife. So they're wildly enthusiastic about this. Most of my columns have actually been either about this program or about sustainable gardening practices, and I'll continue in that vein. And uh, they're going to follow up with news and features about the program. And um, they have their weekly calendar, that, 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 uh, their calendar online and, and in the paper. The one online is updated weekly. So they're going to do everything they can to promote the events. And, um, and I just want to echo what Tim said. It's just it's a fabulous educational program. And, and fairly recently, they added to all the wildlife attracting features, they added the sustainable gardening practices part. And that, that's, you know, that's a nice big part of the application that really just the filling out of it teaches people um, uh, about using mulch and conserving, uh, keeping the rain on their property and, and composting and things like that. So, and this reaches a lot of non-gardeners. So from the gardening point of view, it's a really good way to educate the public about more environmentally friendly ways to garden. Great. The city's part is very minimal. Um, I don't think that we're going to have a lot of expenditures, and I don't think in, in one of the park, uh, Spring Park, the number one, is ready to go now. It has everything we need. It's got um, some food for the wildlife. It's got water already, and there's lots of uh, shelter and for raising young birds, at least, if not other animals, and um, we have trees. We're certainly aware that Spring Park has water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so many of the people who brought it to our attention haven't necessarily considered it an asset. Um, when when uh, you first contacted me and I looked at the materials and everything, it struck me as what a wonderful project this would be for the schools. And I, and I wonder whether you uh, made any outreach to any of the PTAs. And I know in the past the PTAs, for example, have applied for grants for the Tacoma Foundation for, for various kinds of projects that the kids could do. And I wonder if you um, made any outreach to any of the PTAs because I just think this would be a wonderful project no, for the kids have, in schools. Yes, we, we know we need to do that. Uh, this is one of the nice things about Tim, he's recently joined our group, and we finally have a member of the major group who actually has a child in one of the schools. His daughter's named Zoe, and she's a... Uh, so I've talked to Joy about this a little bit. Yeah. Right? She's Park Elementary School, and approaching them about mm -hmm. their existing butterfly garden, and integrating yes. what they're already doing for uh, you know, environmental awareness, for environmental education, with this effort to just you know, move a little bit further and get it certified. Yes, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think it's a great idea, too. Um, and a couple things came to mind as you were talking, and one is that I have to remember to put a bell on my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I know domestic animals, that's, you know, that's, that's yeah. part of an issue, and there's a, there's a certified garden, or backyard, in, uh, in my area, and they've got a big no-dog sign trying to discourage people even from bringing the dogs along the perimeter there because it's like a corner lot um, but so that's all good but one of the one of the things when you said encouraging more water in backyards one of the first um, emails that I got as a city council person was about mosquitoes um, and so I spent a lot of time discouraging people from having standing water in their backyard could you tell me well, I, if, what I've, the impact would be I've got in my backyard a, a little fish pond as well as as for uh, bird baths. And uh, <coughs> the, going way back, I used to be on the committee that was looking into West Nile virus on the mosquitoes. And one thing I learned there was that the life cycle of the mosquitoes is about a week. And to the extent that you can do anything at all to just flush any of those, well, first of all, bird baths typically dry out in a week if you left it on its own. but what I end up doing is I have to add water to them, and if you just flush it out, there goes the mosquitoes on that. And then as far as my uh, my fish pond, actually, the, it has goldfish in it, very non-native. Uh, <laughs> but they love mosquito larvae, so I actually don't have any problems from the standing water that I've got. And the key is, 
that you take a look at it to see, first of all, running water, if you had a running water system, uh, will not sustain mosquitoes. They drown, the little larvae drown. Uh, then secondly, if you had a goldfish pond, probably you, should, you shouldn't have a problem with that. And in terms, and then the last thing is with the uh, bird bass, that kind of thing. If you just flush it out, that's all it takes. And just if you did it once a week, you'd probably be okay. The other thing I might add is that um, and we should probably consult with the National Wildlife Federation on this. But as you know, Tacoma Park has lots of streams, lots of areas of natural water, and. I'm not sure how much it really matters whether a specific property within its boundary has water, so much that there's water very nearby. You know, a bird doesn't have to have water on every single lot, bird and lot to come apart, as long as they can find a stream with the water will to get to. So we might be able to figure out whether, for example, Forest Park, uh, there's a stream on the property right behind Forest Park, it's not officially on Forest Park's uh, physical space. I would think that that would still count as providing water for wildlife. And in that sense, we're not adding any water to the, to the, to the mix of mosquito sites. Um, we're just taking advantage of existing water sources. Who, who comes out and certifies a house or property? Well, at least the yards are, are done at a distance. In other words, what happens is they look at your application, <coughs> and I think it's a matter of, of trust that you're, you're not, you know, what's, what's just, just no big prize that you're going to get out of this. <laughs> not an incentive to lie about you. But, uh, but they do, it's a two, actually, I, I brought applications for you all. <laughs> it would be interesting <laughs> to see them. I'd really like to see it, yeah. In fact, actually, yeah, we've got some of them now. Yeah, does so this help give you I, I have a third of an acre that's, like, totally wooded, except for where the house is, mm -hmm. and, and a small green, and a small, perhaps, grass area, depending what decides to grow there. But... Everything else is, is woods, and I'd be happy to, you know, oh, yeah. to yeah. certify it. Good. Actually, they have a, at the other extreme, they have a lot of flexibility about <clears throat> what they'll go for, because they have they have certified even balconies, and I think the way you might <coughs> get a balcony certified is if you had uh, probably you know, like a bird feeder and maybe a hummingbird feeder and, and uh, maybe a number of nectar-type plants, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and a, a little bird bath, all of it attached to your railing, you could actually probably qualify. And it's just a matter of you know being honest about it, saying what you do have, and, and seeing what they go for. Because again, it's those those five elements they're looking for, you know, of, of basically food, water, habitat, cover. I don't know how you'd provide cover for breeding critters on your. <laughs> but they have certified nest boxes or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I knew this was going to come up when I I started talking to somebody about you know sort of wildlife habitats and they looked at me and they said what kind of wildlife are we <laughs> I mean how do we ensure we get the right kind of wildlife and not say rats because we the same thing with Colleen you know been telling people not to have standing water I mean we've been telling people oh don't support you know food and 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 cover on your on your property because you'll get rats how do we how do we get the right kind of wildlife? But first of all, I think they do have some flexibility in the way they look at if you decide that you're not, you know, in some cases they talk about if you really wanted to attract, uh, say, rabbits and, and uh, maybe possums, you might have a little wood pile. But if you decided that you really would rather just emphasize the attraction of your yard to birds and butterflies, then you might not want that wood pile, and you might not, because you might feel uncomfortable about having a little wood pile there mm -hmm. that would perhaps have possums in it, might actually have a, a place for rats and so on. When it comes to, I think rats are probably the biggest problem with rats is when you have uh, kind of an excess of uh, bird seed and it's not very well controlled, and a lot of it is falling to the ground. And then near where it's falling to the ground, you've got a lot of cover for rats to come and go. Uh, I had rats briefly, and then what I did was I sort of broke the cycle with the seeds. Uh, I just It was a time of year. Fall is actually a time of year when you really don't need to have bird seed because there's so much natural seed around and so many, so many berries. And then later on when things get frozen, it's good to put it back up again. 
but sort of breaking that cycle seemed to break the cycle with the rats coming and going. So. On the um, Tacoma Heart uh, listserv, there's been some discussion now and then and in descri description of how to avoid getting rats, uh, that they have certain habits. What is it that they, they, uh, they nest or, or live uh, only within a certain fairly short distance from a uh, food source? So if, if you are careful with your food source, what I did was put trays under all my bird feeders so that they, the seed doesn't fall down to the ground, although there's enough down there still for the, you know, mocking, for the morning doves and things. But um, the rats went away. <laughs> now, I was expecting someone to ask about deer. Now, don't ask me. <laughs> we don't have deer in this community. But we're not going to attract them. We're not going to attract them. We have no. Let's not get it. We have deer. Like, we're not going to attract we any more no deer, deer by these methods that we've already got. Wolves or what else? But, well, they're talking about coyotes, and presumably you wouldn't get those in a fairly urbanized area like this. Not so foxes. Yeah. Coyotes. Are. And there's a rumor that there was one seen up in weeds. So. A what? A coyote. A coyote. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, coyote. Well, well, what, I don't think we're talking particularly about carnivores if we're talking about berries and seeds and things, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Except people's cats. Um, I just want to thank you all for bringing this forward. I think it's a, a terrific initiative, and I do hope to um, engage the schools uh, in, in something very productive. There's also a lot of wild areas in, um, in city property and park and planning property. So, um, Mike, I'm glad you're here. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is about the um, sustainable gardening practices. Do we have... Uh, as part of our city practice, these, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we, there's no problem there because I don't use any pesticides whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Nor do I practice to, and we we use our mulch and right. it's, it's compost. Compost. Mm -hmm. We make our own. In fact, <laughs> yeah, you, and you use drought tolerant plants. It's drought tolerant plants, so Great. we're there. And I haven't I haven't found an absolute prohibition against pesticides or fertilizers or chemicals. In fact, I, I use spot applications of uh, herbicides, say, to take out poison ivy, things like that. So, right. so I, I don't think we're trying to look for something that's absolutely... Mm -hmm. Same way as uh, another question that hasn't been asked yet, but about native plants. Uh, the reason for favoring native plants is that, of course, they are actually co-evolved with the critters that are trying to eat them. Uh, so you're likely to have a, a reasonable success with them. There are also uh, better, usually better adapted to our climate, and they may be more drought climate, you know, drought resistant, and so on. But I have many, many azaleas in my yard that are wonderful. I'm not going to rip them out. There's peonies, but I have uh, quite a few other natives, and I think the expectation is that you kind of look for a balance with all that. Right. The only other thing I wanted to um, uh, ask about is I, I see that you've mentioned Arbor Day as part of this initiative, um, kind of a, a mark on the timeline there. And I would love for you to include Rachel Carson Day, which comes in May uh, as well, because there's you know year-round opportunity for um, uh, thinking about sustainable gardening practices and. Uh, protecting wildlife and um, Rachel Carson Day is something that the City Council has recognized I believe two years in a row and it's a day when uh, we try to um, make a statement to the public and, and uh, provide a little bit of education about um, uh, not using pesticides and synthetic uh, compounds in our environment so um, uh, that's that's it yeah but thank you very much yeah, I just want to uh, thank you for this application because looking at it, I see that uh, an awful lot of what's needed on here is what I'm already doing. Mm -hmm. um, some things might be uh, maybe a little counter to some of the other things that people want to have happen or that the city requires to have happen. Like uh, I know that uh, I've been every doing everything I can to reduce my lawn, including 
not cut the back all year. So I've provided a nice little habitat back there. <laughs> um, and one other thing is that uh, it's connected to this discussion. It's not appropriate for the what's happening at Tacoma Park, but it was very interesting to me. I saw a program this weekend on kind of the history and development of New York City focusing mainly on Manhattan. They had a large segment of the program on Central Park and the development of Central Park. And something that was very surprising to me was that all of the source for water in Central Park is not, I'll call it natural. It all comes from the city's water system. And, and they had one of the engineers who is in charge of maintaining Central Park, and he went around and showed all of these big cutoffs down under plates in the ground in Central Park, and he said, you see that nice little waterfall with the babbling brook coming down through there? And he turned the thing, and he turned it off. <laughs> and that thing is like 800 acres, and all the water comes from the city system and goes right back into it again. Uh -huh. Chlorinated water? I don't know. Any other questions? Well, I certainly think this is a great idea, and um, I know that you've you've met with Daryl and had some conversations with her, and so I assume that the next step on this would be to have a continuing discussion with the city staff and maybe for us to do a resolution in support of this um, at some point in the future. And you said, Bruce, that you had a... I had a, a couple of models. Yeah. One of them is really more of a letter, and the other one is much more of the types of resolutions I've seen before, you know, with the whereas. So, okay. So it depends on your preference. Well, um, you know, I think that would be, we could um, put that on the agenda. I don't think that that would be a terribly controversial thing, and we can sort of get it moving because there seems to be uh, great support on the council right. for moving forward in this direction. And I appreciate your, uh, you all getting together and, and the work that you've done, and, and I think the, the application for people who are at home thinking about this and thinking it's very complicated, the application, you're right, is really quite simple. I mean, you do have to know what's in your yard, um, and you do have to be able to provide certain things, but almost all of them are things probably that you already provide. And um, I, I think the application looks like it would be quite doable for the majority of the people in our community. But in fact, it's, we've already made ourselves available, uh, four of us, to be consultants or mentors or anybody who really wants somebody to come to their yard and just take a look at it. I mean, I'm glad to do that. I've already done it a couple of times. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be, uh, it partially is just sort of fun. It's like if you've got all these trees and things, you really don't know what they are and which right. ones are native and non-native. It's kind of a little treasure hunt to figure out, oh, okay, that's what that is. Yeah. Uh, and then that one part of the that one part of the application, then it really just says what types these things are. But then it encourages you to go ahead and list your plant species if you know what they are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will have a tough time with that. But don't let that be a stumbling block. I, I will help you. That's the blank on my paper. Yeah, that, <laughs> I, I was thinking. I have a number of those those um, plants known as. Plantus unknownus. <laughs> I've, I've got a few mystery ones in my yard. So. Okay. Well, we we will then. If you can get me the information on the resolution, we can we can go ahead and, and work on um, getting that on a future agenda. Thank you all so much for the work that you've done and. Uh, um, I'm sure we can do that was a that was a nice article that you did Tim and I think that will be quite helpful and certainly uh, um, if we can get information on how people can contact you if they're interested in uh, finding out but I think the point that you made which is that most people um, who have um, any type of reasonable backyard probably wouldn't have to do very much to qualify is something that uh, we should get that information out uh, right now so that people feel encouraged to uh, move forward with some of this. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. There's nothing else. We're adjourned.